hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to MIT Professional Education Digital Plus Program webinar, Innovation, A Road to Disaster. So in today's session, we are going to be debunking common innovation myths and buzzwords. Uh, so my name is Liz Coffey, and I'm going to be the moderator of our webinar today. I uh, just wanted to say thank you all so much for joining us. We're happy to have you here with us today in what no doubt will be a very fun and engaging session. Um, so quickly before we begin, uh, I'd like to go through some logistical information. Um, before we get started. So I want to encourage everyone, please turn your camera on. Um, myself and um, Professor Breva, we really like to see everyone who's, who's here in the session. We like to see your faces um, and we want it to be as interactive as possible. So um, if you feel comfortable, please go ahead and turn your cameras on. Um, we also uh, welcome all of the questions you have. So I think it looks like we have about um, 43 participants today. Um, so due to kind of having a, a larger number, you know, we welcome your questions in the chat. If you have a really burning question that you'd really like to ask, um, if you want to raise your Zoom hand, uh, we can kind of take some questions throughout the session as well. Um, and we're aiming to have around maybe 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session for kind of a dedicated Q&A time. Um, and so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Luis Breva, uh, who will be leading our session today. Um, Professor Breva is an expert in technological innovation. He's an entrepreneur, and he's the author of Innovating, a Doer's Manifesto for Starting from a Hunch, Prototyping Problems, Scaling Up, and learning to be productively wrong. Uh, furthermore, he is the faculty director of innovation teams, also known as iTeams, which is MIT's flagship joint enterprise between MIT School of Engineering and MIT Sloan to put the Institute's deep tech advances to work to solve real world problems. In addition to all of that, he also leads the MIT Professional Education Digital Plus program entitled Systematic Innovation Scaling Up from a Hunch, which launches February 28th. So coming up soon in about one month. Um, and with all that being said, and without further ado, I wanna pass the microphone over to you, Professor Breva. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, we're so happy to have you and take it away. Great, thank you, Liz. And thank you everybody for being here today. So we have about one hour to sort of be together and address a bunch of questions about what this innovation might be, buzzwords and whatnot. And as Liz said, I would appreciate if we can see your faces the same as if we were in, a, in an auditorium. So this will make it feel much more approachable. If you are in a compromised situation, by all means, don't share your camera, but otherwise feel free to. I also would like to have this session be as conversational as possible, which is the way I like to run my classes at MIT too. So I'm going to offer lots of insights and content, but I hope that this will actually prime you to start to think about questions you may want to ask. We'll run for about half an hour. And then at the end of it, you guys hopefully will ask lots of questions. Now, the title of the webinar is Innovation and Road to Disaster with a question mark. And uh, and I mean that. So th this, is, this webinar comes out of spending the last 15 years teaching innovation at MIT, specifically turning MIT technologies into new organizations that actually thrive and doing that with technology and then afterwards without technology. And um, I'm here to tell you that some of the things that most of us think work about innovation, most of what we've been hearing for the last 15 years actually doesn't work. And it's confused a lot of my students. Uh, so my students now come to class, now as in like in this year and every year the last 10, come to class expecting that I'll have an answer to this particular strange question which is how to go and pitch a disruptive, exponential, scalable idea for a minimum viable product that will somehow be self-evident and will take over the world so rapidly, you will not have to worry about how you'll make money. In other, in other words, what they're actually hoping is that somehow I'll teach them how to come up with ideas that you don't need to do any work on because they are just already perfect and they just work on their own. I trust a lot of you already know that that's not possible. But still, you know, there is, this recipe looks so much like magic that you would kind of want it to be true, right? So um, it turns out this is just innovation by brute force. It's the least 
efficient way to actually innovate. And what I've found myself doing over the last 10, 15 years is coming up with ways to explain to my students why that doesn't work. I used to spend only five days explaining this. Now I have to spend an entire month debunking myths. And today we're going to do that in just 40 minutes. And part of the trade today is that I'm going to be incredibly provocative. I'm going to be provocative partly because the topic invites it, but also partly because you don't come here to kind of be told something you already know. You come here to be provoked some thoughts. So whether you actually choose to believe what I'm going to tell you today or not, the point is that you think about it and you make the best out of it. In other words, my role as an indicator is not to give you a recipe so you become a robot, but rather the opposite, to de-robotize you so you can actually think the best way to go about it. And so let's go and get started with the two main things that my students actually get confused about from the get-go. The first one is this one. And I'm going to, oh, by the way, before I get started, you're, I need to show you about my tricks. So on occasion, I'll kind of become tiny and show you a slide and appear at the top, right? Uh, so adjust your screens however way you need to so that you can actually still see me and read the slides. On occasion, I'll move around like this. This is mostly not to cover the slide and also to confuse you a bit because I think that's entertaining. And uh, just joking. And, um, and, uh, and so I will try to kind of show you some slides, but also show you my face and so we can have an interaction uh, now and then. There will be no fancy screen share or no usual Zoom screen sharing. So all you need to do is make sure you can see my screen nice and however big you need it to. So start with that. So let me get started with the idea. So the first problem or confusion my students get with or, or you know, get tripped by is this one, which is the notion of fail fast. Now, let me pause and say, what do we mean by actually fail fast? It turns out that there's this mantra that just became popular over the last 15 years and only the last 15 years that somehow you have to fail fast and often in order to succeed. And to me, it just makes no sense. My observation is that the companies that actually survive, the ones you actually love and would love to imitate, all of them one by one actually are the ones that survive. Put another way, the ones that actually fail to fail. So. If you actually continually try to practice failing fast, then what is it that you're actually practicing that makes you be more successful? And I know it might sound like a mouth word, but that's the first confusion. I don't know what failing fast continually amounts to practicing. And that confuses my students. So what I tell them is the objective isn't to fail, right? So let's not practice that. The objective is to survive your ideas, right? So you should start by actually trying to kill your every idea rather than just failing and hope to learn at the end of it. There's a difference, and it's not just a difference of vocabulary. There's a difference in intent, right? You don't just get one fancy idea and then hope it will work and then fail fast. No, just get the idea and try to destroy your own idea. And if it survives, the two of you will. So that's the first key idea that my students get wrong. Notice it might sound like nuance, but tomorrow it will look like a shift, my, uh, an important um, mindset shift. The second idea my students kind of get wrapped up with is this notion. So we come from a pre-pandemic world in which there were these ideologies called lean startup that had become incredibly popular. And they promised kind of the path to innovation by spending little by little with small experiments and minimum viable ideas and so on. And it's kind of really appealing when you think about it, because, you know, you spend little by little and you arrive at the coveted price of innovation, right? But spending little by little is also a tried and tested method to waste an enormous amount of money without noticing. So which one is it? You know, I'm sure your grandparents have told you this, don't just spend little by little, you'll actually waste a lot of money, right? Think about your, how you spend the money first. So which of the two is it going to be, is going to be the good advice? Um, and, and why has it become so popular, right? So, what I tell my students is that the objective isn't to spend little by little or do small experiments. Do an experiment as big as you need it to be so that you don't waste a single dollar, right? In other words, learn a disproportionate amount from however much money you have. The number of small experiments you run is completely relevant, right? And the size of the experiment is completely relevant. What matters is that you have planned for the outcome to be relevant. And that doesn't depend on the size of the experiment. 
Why am I saying this? It's again, it's a tiny, small nuance. But that gets all of my students confused because weren't we supposed to do small experiments? That, no, who cares about the size of the experiment? Just get however much money you need, right? It's a different mindset again. It's a different viewpoint. Now, my students then ask me, well, how come these things have become so popular? Why is it that fail fast and spend little by little, right? Have become so popular. And so what I tell them is that this is a mantra that makes sense if you're not going to do anything. If your job is to see how other people do it, right? If you're an investor and you don't know absolutely anything about the domain in which you are actually investing, then you can only hope that uncertainty will go away, right? And obviously you would want for uncertainty to go away by effectively hoping that people will fail as fast as possible. So you don't have to put more money in them, right? And hoping that um, they will only spend a little bit of money to actually fail. So this is a mindset that makes perfect sense when you are on the investing side and you don't know absolutely anything about the domain you're actually going to walk into. Because the mantra for investing is, you know, to diversify your investment, right? And allocate your money wisely, right? And so absent information, you should diversify as much as possible. However, if you're not an investor side, if you're actually trying to do something, that's not the correct approach. The correct approach is try to learn as much as you can with the resources you have and do not fail, right? Plan for not failing and act for not failing. So, so then some people wonder why do startups mostly fail? I mean, why do startups fail? Why so many startups fail? And the answer is they fail by design because they follow a method that's thought for the investors, not for the building of companies. So I know that's a lot to take in, but if you are with me now thus far, that these are the two biggest things that get most of our students confused and that we need to work towards actually getting a better viewpoint for what they need to work, work on and for the mindset ahead, uh, then you'll agree that there is a question that's important to us today. I think we've earned the right after this pandemic, as the pandemic hopefully winds down, to kind of come up with a good meaning for these words. So what does entrepreneurship and innovation even mean today? And the, the bigger problem here is, how do we even make sense of the litany of words that all seem to mean the exact same thing? Entrepreneurship, technology, marketing, fundraising, innovation hubs, entrepreneurs, design, design thinking. You know, you can read the list here. So what I want to go, what I want to do in the next kind of five minutes is go over three of these keywords and show you that we have a unique opportunity to, and perhaps it's a unique opportunity that has been given to us by what we have had to live through to rethink what we actually think we want those keywords to mean. And those keywords are at the center of all the buzzwords that are in every single one of the innovation methods you hear about. All of which, by the way, are no older than 15 years. That's a very important thing, meaning most of the companies that are alive today never use those methods. So let's go on. First one, there is this idea that in order to kind of progress, you need to be disruptive. You need to come up with disruptive ideas. And so for the last 10 years, disruption meant this, right? All kinds of evocative images. But if you go to the dictionary, that's not what disruption means, right? It's not even clear why you would you even want disruption? Why do you even need it? Uh, it turns out that the origin of the keyword comes from a misinterpretation of Christensen's first book, where people realized that incumbents or the market for incumbents may be challenged. And uh, as a result, uh, their market disrupted. And people thought maybe it's the idea that came in that was disruptive. And so people have been looking for disruptive ideas, hoping to capitalize on the innovation power from those books. But that's not what Christensen meant. At any rate, he raised the last 20 years. Now we actually know what disruption means, right? No one needs to tell us what disruption actually means, right? It's pretty obvious. I don't need to explain to you. It's not fun, right? So I don't think disruption should be the objective. It may happen. You may end up disrupting someone else's market or someone else's company. But that's not the objective, hopefully. Um, hopefully, you know, you may, if you look at the actual history of the keyword, you will actually discover that there's many more that we've done to ourselves by actually obsessing so much about disruption, which is create companies that do not become profitable, like Uber. Right? We've created a lot of inequality, by actually obsessing with disrupting people as opposed to kind of helping people. And so this is no longer the objective. So I would invite you, 
and through the through the, all of the content I've shared online and in my new courses online and in my courses at MIT, I invite people to stop using the idea of disruption as an objective, not worth it, not the right objective. That's one idea, one keyword, one buzzword that I hope you'll abandon as I have. Here comes the second one, exponential growth. So for the last 10 years, people have talked about singularities and exponential ideas, right? Most of the people that talk about exponential ideas don't realize that it's just mathematical cube that means that things double over time. So it became very fuzzy as a word, like meaning like infinite riches in a short amount of time. And of course, who doesn't want that, right? So here's the idea, people preconate it. So it's, it's, it's like, hey, how about we have an idea that's already exponential? Then we'll make a lot of money and increasingly more money in like no time, right? And the more time goes by, the more money we'll make. And that of course sounds great, except that now we actually know what the keyword exponential really means, the actual meaning of it, right? We just saw it, right? We've lived through what exponential means, what a change like that means. And now I don't want to abuse this analogy, but I think it's really important because all of us now understand what that keyword actually means. And we don't think, I have never seen a company do these kinds of progressions. So whatever they meant about exponential remains a mystery to me. I, in, I understand the objective, make a lot of money very quickly, but this is not what the keyword exponential means, so I don't know. And to me, it's really important that we use keywords to understand one another rather than use keywords just because they sound evocative. So one more keyword I want to throw out there, this might be a bit controversial. Um, so, minimum viable product. What does this even mean? I'm going to ask you to pause and think carefully about what this possibly could mean. Um, I know what the origin is. It comes from product design. And in product design, it was the second to last step of an incredibly laborious process, a very labor intensive act. So in product design, it makes perfect sense. What I didn't know what it means is in startup world, where people think that you just can come up with a minimum viable product and start selling it. I don't even think that's ethical, right? But most importantly, where goes, where does the quality go, right? Making a product is a complicated thing. I don't know of anybody that can do a minimum viable product and not end up selling it too expensive or effectively force the consumers to pay for something that needs enormous debugging. So the consumers are funding the particular endeavor. Um, so are you truly focusing on the customer when you're actually forcing the customer to be your unpaid uh, bug detector? That's the important question for me. Most importantly, is this the right way to go? Would you board a minimum viable plane, right? Why I'm asking you this question? Well, there is obviously a limit to all of, for all of us about when we will actually accept a minimum viable product as an idea. And it turns out that the limit is very low. So any method that actually talks about minimum viable products is automatically narrowing down the degree of applicability to products you don't care about enormously for your everyday life. So what about everything else? How do you innovate for something that's actually worthwhile with planes, with cars, flying cars, finances of people? So I don't know if you guys have any questions thus far. Uh, I'll have a couple of more things to throw your way. One is that when you put all these previous keywords together and you think about the method, it would only be logical to think that the process is as simple as getting in a room, distributing post-its, calling ideas, and then somehow the one that's disruptive, exponential, and, uh, and um, you know, minimum viable product will somehow become obvious. If you guys, we've all been there. We've all been in these rooms where people throw post-its around and you have to kind of put ideas together and hopefully somehow something will become obvious. So what I'm trying to tell you is that if you believe in those keywords, you're also believing that somehow great innovations will be obvious and evident by inspection. If not, I don't know how you could come up with something that's disruptive, exponential, minimum viable product, all in one from the get-go. I want to stop talking about those guys now, and I just show you kind of how things really are, right? Um, so because the start is actually much more interesting 
than just going around collecting post-its. It's so much more interesting. You should, I don't know why anybody would actually go and do that. So, and I want to give you one real story about how this started. So, um, I'm going to ask you, see if you know what this is. You can put something in the chat. This is my way of letting you know that, you know, from now on, I'm going to expect that you guys start thinking about questions because in about 10, 15 minutes, I'll stop talking and we'll still have 25 minutes. So this is to get you guys warmed up. You can say whatever you want about this thing. My book talks about being productively wrong. So as long as you're wrong, you're good. Uh, I'll make it productive. So um, someone says, comment? oh, sorry, sorry, Luis. Go, go ahead, ahead, Luis, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Aristarco says an analog computer. Great. So this is an analog computer. What else does this evoke? What if I told you that this is the beginning of something that changed the world? Let me just give you a few wink. Mean, obviously, this is the cover of a magazine, right? So that's it. It's, it's a version of popular, I mean, one version of popular electronics from some month. I don't know if it can be read, uh, some January in the 70s. Mm. A poster graphic design. What do you think this triggered? Don't be afraid, you know. You could say anything, you know, this triggered whatever, the Carter administration or- um, Julio says, this is the pioneer of the personal computing era. The pioneer of the personal computing era. Home PC circa 1970s, before Steve Wozniak created the Apple One. Beginning of innovation. So the, all of those are right, but the really cool story actually with exactly this cover is this one. So this is a magazine that sold a kit for home do-it-yourself enthusiasts, enthusiasts that would actually want to assemble their first personal computer. So as Jim said it, it's the home PC and as said, Julio said, the pioneer of the personal computer. So they're both right. What's interesting about this particular one is this is, was a magazine that could be bought at the Harvard Square kiosk and was bought by two people of names William Gates and Paul Allen. So the beginning of that innovation, which I think, you know, I don't even need to describe, is this. It's not a post-it, it's not a room full of whatever, it's not an exponential idea, it's a desire to tinker and make things tangible. But it's the precise opposite of what most of those methods will have you do. Actually, let me, explain to, to, let me explain to you here that one of the things I found most difficult for my students is to realize that when trying to apply those methods, they become incredibly theoretical. So they postpone doing stuff, right? What we get is lots of posters and lots of theoretical ideas about how markets behave and how minimum buy products are and how many questions are going to ask to people and people that go out on a spree and are asking questions to 100 people that as if that was going to kind of help them in some way. So, but the reality is that innovation is much more fun. You get started by doing and combining things that mostly already exist. Pearl is asking, was this a minimum viable product but just then? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think the idea of minimum viable product exists. And most importantly, as I said earlier, I don't even know what those people from the Lean Startup mean by minimum viable product. And it's not that they haven't read the books, it's that I pride the keywords, right? So I know what minimum viable product actually means in the context of product design, but how can you have an idea today and proclaim it to be minimal, minimal and viable without any further experimentation? So what does that mean? The fact that you call it so doesn't actually mean it is. It took the guys that were actually producing this an enormous amount of work and labor to produce this particular kit. They barely made it. There's a wonderful telling of this story online. So let me keep on going. So when you put this together, I'm going to just simply tell you that when my students come and they think that what they have to do is validate their exponential, disruptive, scalable, minimum viable, empathized, viral idea and act like an entrepreneur, I tell them, no, this is not what you do. This is not fun. This is posing, right? What I tell them to have to do is stop agonizing over whether your idea is any good or not, right? Get organized, find out what's wrong about it, fix it, right? And that's a much different approach to the whole endeavor. If you accept that this is a slightly better vantage point from which you start, you might even actually find things from those books that are actually useful to do. Just not the entire book, the over, those books and those ideas overgeneralize a process that did not apply to the whole thing, set of things you could actually accomplish with innovation. Now, I know I'm asking you to, to <laughs> I'm asking you a big, 
big thing, right? Um, I've told you I've grown convinced that this is sort of like a recipe for magic, these kinds of things. Um, I've told you I was convinced and I've observed over the last 15 years that we've been going about innovation all wrong. Um, and I appreciate I'm asking you to forego something that has become incredibly popular over the last 15 years. Incredibly popular. Everybody thinks they understand, they even share the language to a point that they actually believe they're actually communicating. And there's this just one guy at MIT that's saying, no, guys, this is not the right way to go. And maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. And you would be, it would be right for you to doubt me. So um, I'm actually to accept that these things like the lean startup and design thinking that have become so popular and have become so full of keywords that everybody uses are actually wrong. And not because I care about them being wrong or not. I think they fulfill the purpose, which was popularize an ambition of being more innovative. They just did not deliver on it. Uh, I don't care about them being wrong. I care about you guys not wasting your time, right? But still, it's a lot to ask. And I've seen it before. There was this one year in class when I actually explained very methodically why, if you actually went with design thinking for innovation without a clear product in mind, you would end up just biasing yourself and falling prey to confirmation bias and availability bias. And this one student stood up angry, screamed at me and left the room. Right. Uh, it turns out that the student in question was the president of the design thinking club at the MIT Sloan uh, School of Management. I should have done my homework before. So I apologize to any of you that are actually design thinking and lean startup proponents. My intent is not to destroy those, those methods, but actually the point remains that we are putting the burden on the ideas as opposed to on the work. And so no wonder people just try to have ideas and no one's doing anything. So still, it's a lot to ask. Let me show you a few data points so you guys can actually start to think about it. One of them, my favorite one is to look at the cost. There is a cost to embracing these beliefs and the cost is not little by little. And so a table I actually use, a version of this table I use in class, I want to share with you guys today is what's the actual hidden cost of living by this legend of minimum viable promises and learning by design and so on. So a lot of people talk about, and one of the biggest, some of the biggest companies propone or kind of have emerged from the ideas of minimum viable products and testing in that particular way are Uber and Airbnb. Actually, it is not uncommon for people to say, I'm going to build the next Uber off or to hear someone, we will do the Airbnb off. So let's actually look at their numbers, right? This is a table I produced in 2017. What you see here is the money they had to raise before they went public. It's just one good measure as any other, right? And what you see here is how many times they had to go out and ask for money. And I'm comparing them with two ones, two that are also famous, right? That are not known to be kind of proponents of the minimum Bible mantra, right? So you can see the numbers. If you want to build the next Uber off doing what they did, and I'm not saying it's a bad idea, you need to be ready to go and ask for money 23 times in under 10 years and to raise about $24 billion. That's what their method afforded to them. And still get to a point where you're not profitable. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I say this is the actual cost of following that particular approach. I'm not even criticizing Silicon Valley for this. People often mistake the idea and say that well, this is our fault of Silicon Valley. It's not that, right? There's an approach to do things that requires you go about it this way. You'll still be the phenomenally big business. It will still take an enormous amount of work but this is the actual work. If you're not ready to go out and ask for money 23 times in nine years, then maybe this is not the method you should follow. It certainly is neither fast nor cheap or inexpensive or lean. So that's one idea. The second idea is that if you went with these methods, you would actually believe that innovation is all about startups and that you have to act like a startup all the time. And then, you know, what I, the other thing I show to students is that another version of this table, which is just show for examples of companies that we think are innovative. And this is my way of to remind you that some of the greatest innovations that we're enjoying came from companies that were 100 years old. So acting like a startup is certainly a choice, but it, it is still a choice, right? Um, so Apple had fended bankruptcy before they developed the iPhone and it was already 30 years old. IBM was 100 years old in its last reinvention as an AI company. Monsanto is the leader of uh, Agritech 
in seed engineering. You may or may not like that topic, but it's a highly heavy topic. And they started as a different kind of company 100 years earlier. And Nintendo started as a card company, card as in like playing cards. And after various attempts at reinventing themselves, they ended up becoming a video game company. But they are more than 100 years old also. Hablando de Nintendo. So, I think we have Renato uh, is unmuted. Renato, I don't know if you're asking us a question or, or, or there is a muting accident. Let me just get to this. So what I'm trying to kind of persuade you of is there, there is a, another way to think about it. That much like you can actually think about Uber and building the next Uber of things, which is a software startup without assets that coordinates cab rides. I'm sure they would not like that description. Uh, that needed $24 billion before IPO, that was founded in 2009, and that it went in IPO 2019, meaning in 10 years they went public and they needed $24 billion. There are other ways to do things by which you can actually create equally interesting companies, right, in the exact same amount of time, right, for a tenth of the capital it was needed to actually build Uber. And what I, what I, what you will learn in my classes is that these two companies went by completely different processes, but how to build it. But what's interesting is that the biotech startup was the one that was cheapest compared to software startup, which actually should challenge a lot about how you guys think about the innovation, what innovation is easier and what isn't, right? There's a longer story to this. I'm not affiliated with either of these two companies, right? But I want you to open your mind to the possibility that there might be another way to go about innovating systematically that results in this kind of difference, which is a 10, uh, 10 times difference, right? One order of magnitude difference. So that's what my purpose of debunking all those keywords is today. Now, once you accept that this may be a possibility, there's just one more thing I need to tell you about the whole idea of innovation, which is that most of us would want to believe that innovation goes, those great innovations are actually recognizable from the start, right? In fact, whenever you read a book about innovation, of any of the ones you have out there, except of course mine, right? Uh, the best book ever written, by the way. Uh, you would walk away with the idea that everybody figured out the idea, how great it was from the very beginning. Almost every book like shows like people had like clairvoyance. So I'm not going to tell you the answer of this. If you want the answer to this, you know, come and see other things, but these are two pictures. I claim that one of them and only one of them is a model of something that became incredibly successful as an innovation. Lauded the world over, not a tech innovation. Could you tell which of these two is the actual great innovation? You can say yes or no in the chat or with your hand. Those of you that have the camera on. Because if you can't, right, if you cannot tell which of these two was the great innovation, then any process that requires you to guess what's going to be minimally viable and disruptive at the start is actually wrong. Or requires that you have information about the future, which I unfortunately don't have. Could you please share your screen? Because I'm not able to see it. We have a comment from Jim in the chat, and he says the right one, and he commented the first assembly line. So it's a great guess, Jim. Not, but you didn't get it right. So I'll, I'll allow a couple more guesses. Urania Constantino says it's Sagrada Familia. Anybody agree with that? I think it's more about the knitting. Uh... The left is a theater machinery. Yeah. The left one is building on the right one. So there is one thing, you know, there, we have four guesses there, five. It's a knitting, knit, knitting uh, process kind of thing. One is like a... So Manish is saying it's a knitting process. Let's just agree that it's not obvious. There is now right now six guesses about this. One of them is right. One out of six was actually right didn't say which of the two images is the actual one, but it at least detected which one is it, which probably means that this person has seen it elsewhere. So they have information about the future. 
if it is knitting on the first one is the knitting of the old times like uh, which is still ongoing and the second one is very complex knitting kind of thing but maybe it's still not working so if we get lots of questions at the end i'll reveal the answer when we're done today but in the meantime um let me get going with one more question so the whole point of this exercise is to show you that this is all about uncertainty your beginnings about uncertainty there is questions here and there is a guess process going on and there's even a some person that says that this is these two things somehow they are Sagrada Familia, right? So and and so it's interesting to see that not no such thing, there's no such thing as being able to recognize something from the get-go unless you already have information from the future. So the job of innovation is all about managing uncertainty. And the way I like to introduce you to my own students in at MIT and to those of you that will actually join us in the in the online course is to think about it this particular way. So this is a map of the world, according to the people that lived in Earth in some of these places around a thousand years ago. It's not a European map, by the way. Um, we know that this is wrong, right? But the reason we know why this is wrong is because we've seen this picture, right? Don't fool yourself. It's not because you are smarter than the guys that produce that map, right? Not because you've seen this picture, you know that there's missing continents and all kinds of things, right? But if you guess from here what is missing, you might have guessed dragons are missing at the end of the world, right? A turtle holding the world. Uh, but essentially, you know, you know all those things. It turns out it was none of that. We we're missing a few continents, right? So most importantly, the people that will have you guess from the world of today are asking you to predict this world. That's too hard a task, right? The people that actually were able to realize that this map was wrong, they built ships, right? And they planned endeavors. And they did something. They did not just guess. They took a hypothesis and they went on. They were mostly wrong, by the way, along the way. They thought they were going to India for another route and they discovered that that was not true. At least some of them. Some others went a day earlier. So what I'm trying to say, tell you is that the, the work of innovating is actually working with the means from here. So that other picture later, other people later can take this picture. But the world of most of the innovation books and methods that I've been criticizing today is about pretending that you can infer from here how people thought when they only had this. You can't. It's not an inferring or a guessing work. It's actually a doing task, right? So um, I want to leave you with two ideas of how to wrap it up. I've gone at the heart against all those methods. So I'm hoping I will get lots of criticism later and online for this thing today. But I want to leave you kind of two thoughts. Uh, one is, what does this imply? What does this imply? And so what it implies to me is that a different approach. And I think the person that best summarized this approach is the sci-fi writer, E.C. Clark, around the 1950s, when he postulated three laws of prediction. You can find this in plenty of places. It's public information. I did not invent this. So um, he said that when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he or she is almost certainly right. When the same scientist states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. That's law number one. Law number two says, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little ways past them into the impossible. Not guessing, but venturing. Important distinction. And the third one is by the time you're done and you have come up with a new technology, the way he used technology is very similar to how we use today innovation, by the way. I mean, at the time, technology could not mean just apps because there were no apps, right? So um, any new technology is indistinguishable from magic, which to you means that by the time you guys are done with your innovating, people will be mesmerized by innovation. That was one of the questions. Why is innovation so romanticized? Because it looks like magic. But the people that will have you just follow magical methods are not teaching you how to innovate. You're going to have to go a little bit ways past into the limits of the impossible, right? And you're going to have to go against the grain in which a lot of people tell you are wrong. And that's why just asking whether your idea is good is just a totally wrong process, right? It will just prime you for confirmation bias. So if you accept these tenets, this is sort of a rethinking of what innovation might actually mean or how to, uh, as spoken by another person, not me, one of the things that you'll learn about me is that 
I don't claim to have invented the new method for innovation. I just know how to explain it, much like Einstein did not invent physics, but was able to explain to us a bunch of phenomena much better. So um, I'm not trying to put myself in the next category as, I, as Einstein, by the way. That was not the intent. Um, I want to leave you with a few principles, right? Uh, for how to go about innovating. And you can read about this. There's a lot I've wrote about online about how to go about this. But this is like, I told you what it might mean. Well, this might be the way you go about it. And this, with this, I'll close my presentation today. First is that it is irrational to fail in ways that would have could have been predicted. So like, it's not even about failing fast. It's not about failing. But if you're going to fail, it's got to come as a surprise. And it doesn't matter how fast it is. The second is that in the face of uncertainty, Diversification is the only rational choice. So just choosing one product out of a gas and working on that gas is the most irrational thing you could possibly ever do. Third is that the most powerful asset of an idea is not the idea, is that it is malleable, that you can reshape it and change it. And because of that, right, if you fall in love for your idea and you're constantly looking for the disruptive idea, you'll miss on all the work that's required to shape that idea into something that's worth uh, using. And the last thing is that unless ideas are recycled, failed ideas create waste, pollute your innovating and increase your cost. So your job is not to have a whole year of your ideas, but sort of recycle those ideas, leave them for later, and so on. These are the same principles with which we've actually built the programs we've run at MIT that have resulted in more than 40 new technology companies. And they are the same principles that have drove me to kind of share this online and the same principles you can hear about in everything we have online, about this content, about what we've done. So just a couple more things, and then I'll open the Q&A. If you guys have liked what you've heard today and you would like to know more, you can certainly, there's a lot of things for you to guys to do that at all kinds of price points, right? And I'm going to go small for a second here and show you this. Let me just move my stuff here. So um, there's the class I teach at MIT, which you can follow. There's a book you guys can buy online, whatever your books are sold. There is a new course we just started. In the next slide, I'll show you a QR code where you can actually kind of uh, check out. And of course, you can simply just follow what we, what I do and write about on LinkedIn and, and, and Twitter, right? And learn about all the things I typically will talk about, which is companies that build companies, technology repurposing funds, per social value chains, lab to impact, deep tech entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth. So with that, the last thing I want to do is show you the final slide, which is one, my invitation for you guys to throw as many questions as you can at me in the next 17 minutes or so. And you have two QR codes in case you want more information about the online offerings we have and one about uh, just simply registering for it. I don't know which one is which, so I cannot circle them. Uh, thank you very much for listening today and for coming today. In, uh, and I hope you it, this was well worth your hour. Liz, uh, back to you for moderating. Great. Yes, uh, I think I saw um, you leave. You raised your, your Zoom hand. Please feel free. You can go ahead and, and unmute your microphone and ask your question, please. Hello. Thank you very much for the information. Uh, hello from Colombia. Um, just a quick question. How the purpose or the purpose of, of the creation of the innovation uh, act as part of the process? because we can be creating things that destroy us. <laughs> According with the last new technology we have seen, we can create things that can destroy the planet. So how is the purpose uh, acting as part of the process of innovation? So that's, that's a, uh, a phenomenal question. Let me just, uh, I need to kind of get myself bigger again so that you guys can see me full. Has everybody been able to capture this image? Someone was asking in the chat what my handle is. Uh, so it's how oh, Lucy answered that. So let me get back. So the question is, what does the purpose, right? How does the purpose influence, drive, or how can it influence or drive um, innovation? And the sort of the sub subtext of the question is, you know, we've seen technologies nowadays kind of do the precise opposite. And I agree, right? I, I agree on both counts. So first of all, with the methods we've given to ourselves, we have no means to explore the real purpose. And this is why I, I've gone out public and not just done so from the comfort of my class at MIT, but rather gone public, written a book, and done so many talks, even created online courses. 
and, and gone on on the record criticizing these methods. These methods that we have today do not give you a means to explore real purpose. They automatically ask you to think about a product. They automatically ask you to kind of think about people as if they were just users or consumers as opposed to people. And so they truly have no means to explore purpose. And you need to know that because otherwise you would start using the methods and often the methods are not evil. It's just if you don't really understand the body of assumptions upon which they're built, right? You might end up doing something that's disastrous, right? And, 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 and that's what we've seen with many technologies nowadays. Uh, it's another technology, right? It's how people have thought or forgotten to think about the way in which they wanted to kind of bring these technologies to the world. Uh, I believe very strongly that um, the best companies are the ones that figure out a way to do well and do good at the same time. Those companies become profitable and last forever. But it takes a bit more thought to put those companies together. So how do you bring purpose in? So this is kind of one part of your question. The other part is how do you bring the purpose in? So what we talk about uh, in this course and in my course at MIT is that what we teach people what, how to do is solve problems. Now, there's one great thing about problems, which is that problems that have not been solved cannot even be defined properly, right? And so a lot of the work of an innovator is defining the problem you're solving constantly. And that's how you embody the purpose. That's how you embody the how you want to see people. And that's how you use technology too, because you end up using technology to inform and make the problem tangible. Technology becomes a tool, not just a product. It could be part of the product too at the end. But you don't start presuming that you know the product because you just saw one technology. Instead, you focus on the problem. And the problem is how you embody the purpose. It could be a problem that's kind of societal and big. It could be a problem that's commercial. It doesn't matter. That's your choice. But you get to define and work on the actual purpose. Does that help, uh, Yulith? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking additionally that uh, with no purpose, the consequences could be bigger than the initial problem itself. So I don't know if this can be fixed, but what I can see in the last innovation and, and according how I see the world, we are creating more trouble than, than solutions. Well, there is, there's two parts to that thing, right? And one needs to be very careful. So I agree with you that if, assuming that our problems will be solved just because we throw technology at the world, is kind of a bad assumption. We're smarter than that, right? Now, going on and pointing to people that did a lot of work and saying, you guys did the wrong thing and your technology is bad, that's also not productive, right? So the best thing to do is go forward and accept one thing. The same way that I've told you, you cannot predict a product, you can also not predict a problem. You need to work on it, right? So your problem at first will look like, you know, one way. And as you work on it and make it tangible, it will start increasingly look a different way. And you'll make a lot of decisions along the way that will help you keep the purpose intact. And that's how you need. So instead of thinking that it's a one shot at goal, this is a process that's highly evolutionary, in which you modify your technology and your problem and your solution and your market and everything until you get it right. And this is the way most of the great innovations have worked. We don't have time to walk you through all of the examples that caused me to realize that this was the thing. It's been 15 years, but hopefully you'll get to learn more about it from the book or the course and see how you yourself can actually embody that problem and that purpose and work on it until it becomes clear how to actually do it in a way that's not damaging. My hope is that we invite enough of you to do that, then you know there will be no, no space in the world for the people that are just merely speculating with products and technologies, right? And, and I, I hope so. <laughs> so uh, should we go to the next question, uh, Liz? Great, yes, thank you so much, Yulit, for that thoughtful question. And I think the next hand I saw was Jim. So Jim, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work, Lewis, so thank you for this uh, presentation. I think uh, what I'm interested in is, is just the disconnect between uh, what corporations do, which, which corporation, you know, big corporations are actually uh, offer some of the biggest opportunities for innovation from uh, just, just from mere number of people working on them. Uh, not everybody can quit their job and launch a startup. Yeah. Uh, lots of people work in corporations, and I think that's what you've tried to facilitate, and that's kind of what I spent my career also trying to, to accomplish. Uh, but I think the, the um, disconnect between what, in, you know, what actually works in innovation, when you study innovation and, and how it works, and what corporations do is striking. And you know, um, as much 
as uh, startups have lots of problems in terms of what they innovate and how they innovate and uh, what gets funded and what doesn't, one thing that's really interesting about startups is that venture capitalists do not fund ideas. Like they fund teams that already have a project that have, have some type of market feedback, some type of market traction before they get funding. And you know, the rule of thumb in venture capital is that uh, for every 10 investments, only two investments make money for the VCs. Um, you know, 2% lose all their money and, and, and I mean, two, two, two out of 10 lose all their money and six out of 10, you know, break even. So venture capitalists get it wrong 80% of the time. Uh, but when you go into corporations, they only fund ideas and they tend to only fund, you know, maybe a two or three from, and most of those ideas come from the people at the very top of the corporation, where we've got these armies of people that could be innovators and they're not. And so I guess my question for you, Lewis, is uh, are we making any progress? Like, are you making any progress? Uh, because it seems awfully hard to get out of this mold, out of this model. So uh, that's a great question, Jim. Jim, weren't you in the presentation of the book? Uh, yes, at the, uh, at the MIT. At the MIT uh, Press. I yeah. remember we spoke. Uh, we then, did. So th thank, thank you, thank you for, for, for the support then and today. Right. So, uh, so the, um, you know, I, the best way I have to look at this, I, I totally sympathize with what you've said and how you've described uh, corporations today, or at least during the last 10, 20 years, right? The best way I have to look at this is that we go through pendulum swings. So if you look back enough in history, you'll see that, you know, Xerox Park is the obvious example everybody knows about, but there's plenty of others, right? where Bell Labs and so on, where corporations thought they needed to have a capability for open exploration. And there's many ways to structure that capability. There isn't just one way. Uh, and then we stopped and we killed most of those. And that happened in the 90s. And a few survived, mostly IBM, right? Uh, my, as, a, as, a, as a household name, there's plenty of others, but as a household name is IBM. So those that survived having an open exploration capability stay afloat. The people then, embraced and so what happened in the last 20 years which is it's the same thing i've been trying to fight that's why i'm so adamant against these methods and you may remember jim i was already adamant against fail fast in 2017 i think that's the conversation you and i were having uh so uh you know the um, people embraced the posing as innovators rather than the uh, and corporations embraced posing as innovators what i mean by that is you know you can count the number of ideas you have and do charts about it and make it look as though you're innovating just because you have lots of ideas. But having a lot of ideas, you know, doesn't get you anywhere. You need to work on them, right? So increasing what we saw in the last 10, 20 years is people embracing this idea of minimum viable, little effort, lots of ideas, whatever. And it became more like a way to kind of have people excited. And for a while it worked, right? Now, what I'm saying now is that it stopped working because now we've all done enough post-it sessions to know that this doesn't go anywhere, right? And, and, and so on and so forth. So people are starting to demand something more. Most importantly, and this is something that I'm hoping will be an outcome of the hard times we've actually lived through in the last <laughs> three years, people care for things that are genuine, right? A genuine approach and corporations too, they've seen that. So what I'm seeing, and I'm getting a lot of requests is people asking me, how do we actually go about creating our own system where we can truly meaningfully explore ideas that matter for what we want to do, right? So I'm getting a lot of requests like this, but it's been a long way in the making. And a lot of it has been precipitated over the last two years by the fact that people realized that everybody wanted to contribute to help in some way. And the tools that they were given were very shallow. In other words, how many homemade 3D ventilators did we produce, right? Everybody seemed to have a 3D printed ventilator over the last two years, printed, especially at the very beginning. And I don't want to criticize those people because that was out of a true desire of helping, searching for genuine meaning in what you actually do. Um, but it turns out if you had asked policymakers, it turns out that that was not the problem we had. That was the easy one to see. That was where you could actually put your minimum viable product mindset to work, right? But the real problems we have with, we were different. Policymakers talked that we needed to have better masking. We needed to have better means for people to connect with one another and so on and so forth. So we've learned over the last 20 years to solve the obvious problem, the one that needs very little thinking. And now there's more people that want to solve the hard problems, the ones that require meaning. And I'm seeing that both in entrepreneurs that are going after their second venture and they don't want the second venture to just be so speculative. 
And I'm seeing that in corporations that want to have a, set up systems where they truly genuinely build companies that fulfill some kind of aspect of their mission or their drive. So I'm, I'm predicting, and forgive me for trying, uh, kind of a pendulum swing over that next five, six years where you're going to see more of this. And there is examples, there's flagship pioneering, there's Google X, there's a number of examples of people that are trying from a corporate mindset to create the opportunity to explore new problems. Does that help, Jim? This is a long topic that's very much close to my heart. Um, Great, Lucy. Thank you so much, Jim. Oh yeah, sorry, I was just gonna yeah. say, Lucy, please go ahead. Thanks. I agree about the failure and uh, making a, a useless or a, a minimal viable product that will fail. Yeah. But wasn't Amazon's minimal viable product um, a bookshop to start with before it grew? So it was a small, so minimal being small rather than being broken. And also on the failure, um, I, I agree again with the don't fail. Uh, fail early you know why bother if you're going to do that but surely we still need to train more we can fail failure isn't bad because we've got to f find what doesn't work uh, and so failing safely is a better option um, and going back to something you said failing with um, can it then be molded into something else so, so those are two excellent questions and precisely the kind of conversation I love to have with people because it's important that we get our words and the, what we mean right. right. And so I agree with the idea that everything that's now big started out small and less polished than it is today. I don't agree that because you started unpolished, you are now a minimum viable product officially. I think that's a misnomer, right? So uh, yes, they started with a smaller bookstore, the best they could do. But I'm pretty sure, based on what I've read about the story, that uh, Jeff Bezos' aspiration was not for a minimum Bible, whatever, was for big kind of working out. And he, he just didn't allow himself to wait until it was all perfect. Fair enough, right? That's not what I'm proposing, right? But so aspiration for perfection was there. And that's the key difference, right? It's a difference of intent, right? And the key word minimum viable products is also misused from another domain where it is like a very sophisticated effort to try to find the one product that will be enough for people to realize it fulfills the expected mission or expected function without it being confusing. That's the origin of the word in product design. So it's been kind of misinterpreted and generalized in the wrong domain. Most importantly, the approach of going about minimum viable products is incredibly costly. Any kind of planning will do, right? To better than that, right? Um, even if it's a tiny bit of planning. And so that's what I'm trying to tell to people. That approach is brute force. What you're being proposed is brute force. The no concept of minimum viable product as originally intended makes a lot of sense, but it's not the first step either. So that's one part. Uh, but again, you know, yes, everything that's big started out probably small, right? And not as polished. Absolutely agree with that notion, right? Which means you can start today. Absolutely. Now, the second part of your, of, of your comment, which is failure. Failure is such a weird word in English. It's such a weird word because we could say, I failed to do that and doesn't really mean failure, right? And so people that have built all these slogans take advantage of that strange notion of the word and they use it in one way to mean something else. It's the well-known oxymoron, right? That makes so much, uh, so much power. But when you translate that to other languages, it means every sentence means something else. And I happen to speak four languages. I find myself having to explain the concept constantly, what it means until I said, you know what? It doesn't even make sense in English. Why not? Because it's okay to be wrong and then you fix it. Right? So what's wrong with that idea? There's, sure, things are going to be wrong first. I don't have anything in my life that has started out working. So don't beat yourself for things that don't work, right? And then fix it, right? And that mindset, absolutely agree with. Where is failure in this picture, right? You fail when you give up, right? Doing that process. So, and, and I know it sounds like a bit semantics, but I have to tell to my students, it's important you get this, these things right. Because otherwise you're going to imagine that just kind of going around and then failing fast and changing your mind and pivoting around is method. And that's not method, that's madness. It's brute force, right? And so that's, that's how I, I use those words. And without your question, it's really hard to actually explain this. I actually thank you a lot for that question because people get, think that I'm talking about something like I'm really mad about those methods. And no, I, I think they're actually incredibly confusing. They actually confuse them that it's a good process and they say it in the wrong way, right? But it takes a conversation to kind of unearth that. Does that help Lucy address that or? Yes, thank you. All right. 
And unfortunately, it looks like we're just at the hour now. Um, so I don't think we have any more time for any additional questions. Um, but I just want to you know, thank everyone so much for joining. Thank you, Professor Breva, uh, for this session. It was uh, super interesting. And thank you all for your thoughtful questions. Um, also, if you'd like to you know, find out more information in the chat, we have links to the program pages and you can learn more. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, so much. And thank you so much. Professor Breva. Thank you all for coming and I hope to see you soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye everyone.